Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shaper Sessions. My name's Jake. And I'm Russ. Today we have a really wonderful show. Today is all about origin in the classroom. Yeah, it's a good one. We've got Mel Goodwin, a STEM educator from Mount Pleasanton, South Carolina, who's going to be joining us for an interview toward the end of the show. We've got a great project from our Origin in the Classroom Education Guide that we're going to cut today, and we're going to go through all of the guides and assets that we've put together for you, our Origin in the Classroom educators and administrators. Uh, and then we've got a really great giveaway today. Yes, a huge giveaway. Uh, in order to get in on that giveaway, you got to be part of the poll that's happening right below you, on, uh, right below us on the screen. The question of the day is, what digital fabrication do you teach in your curriculum? Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, if you're new to Shaper Sessions, and hopefully we have a lot of new viewers today, we put the call out for teachers and educators to join us for this one. Uh, what we do here is we do an hour-long live presentation on Shaper Origin. Uh, we do giveaways at the end of the show. Uh, we're still going to do the normal giveaways. We've also got a swag pack and a shirt for all y'all that are watching now. Um, for any educators specifically, we've got six questions. Fill them all out. For any non-educators that happen to be watching the show, uh, we do have three questions at the bottom that are specific to your school. Mm -hmm. uh, just put NA for those and you'll be entered to win that swag pack and the shirt as well. But we've got this origin and workstation Huge giveaway. that we are giving away to a school district that's watching today. So yep. if you're an educator, please make sure you answer that poll question and you'll be entered to win. We're going to give that one away after the show this yeah. time. Normally we do those during the show, but we want to, you know, no fakers on this it will one, still no be, fake educators. It'll still be random, but we got to got to make sure mm -hmm. we, we will spin the wheel and announce it later on. Um, yeah, and uh, please answer that poll question. Please also uh, ask questions during the show. We have live chat going with Ted, our support guy in the chat. Uh, he's going to answer as many questions live as he can. And any questions that would be good for Jake and I to answer with a little more demonstration, Ted's going to send to us to answer at the end of the show. Also, if you have any questions for Mel, which I hope you do, we have a ton of questions for him. Also, please feel free, please do drop those questions in the live chat, and we'll ask Mel your questions at the end of the show. All right. Why Let's don't we bring started. Mel on? Yeah. Mel, you there? Are you with us? Hey, Mel. I'm here. <laughs> How's it going? How are we doing? Excellent. Thanks. Doing great. Cool. Um, we just wanted to introduce you really quick before we get too deep into the show. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I started uh, professional life as a marine biologist, worked in the Eastern Caribbean for about 15 years, and then started writing curriculum uh, materials for NOAA in their ocean exploration program. And about uh, 11 years ago, uh, decided that it was time to sort of get involved more with with STEM and uh, the actual application of uh, educational materials. And so I became the STEM coach at Lang Middle School in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and have been growing that program and having a lot of fun, you know, for the last 11 years. Awesome. Thank you. And like I said, we're going to go deep into that interview later at the end of the show, but I just wanted to say, Mel, pipe up at any time if we've got anything going on that you want to add some color to, uh, and we'll be asking you some questions here and there throughout the show as well. I'm sure there's some things, plenty that you can bring to this before we get deep into the Q&A. Um, but we did want to show off a couple things. We've got some props here uh, to show off what we've put together for educators out there in the world. And what have we got, Jake? The classroom guide. This is one of the biggest things when you're bringing origin into your, your whole curriculum. We wanted to make it a little easier so you weren't starting off on a blank slate. We wanted to give you a jumping off point. So we have three different projects that are kind of designed for beginner, middle, and slightly more advanced um, to get your students started, as well as everything you need to know about how to, how to use origin, how to teach origin, and how to purchase origin on our education grant guide. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't we pull up, we've got a couple of slides, Goose on the switchboard. Goose, why don't we pull up the slides of this classroom guide just to show what we're working with here. Um, my mom's a teacher, and I know she puts a lot of effort into designing her curriculums. And so we put as much effort 
into the curriculum as we could to make life easy for you. And we just wanted to show you a taste of that because this is a 55 page guide. So we're not gonna go into the whole, whole thing. Um, but just for a taste of it, here's one page on how to cut with origin, um, which is really the point of this, I think, is to show that it's applicable to all CNC and digital fabrication technologies. This is uh, just a hands-on and you know, engaging way to get students involved in tech like this. Yeah. So we've got, as well, a couple of projects. We've got a beginner project. Yeah, starting it off nice and easy, allowing your students to have a little bit of, uh, have more creativity and using on-tool CAD capabilities to draw, design, write text, create a nameplate of their own. Mm -hmm. CAD being one of those fundamental skills that's applicable not just to digital fabrication, but any type of engineering. Yeah. Our electrical engineers use their electrical engineering CAD here. Our mechanical engineers use their mechanical engineering CAD. We got seven different types of CAD yeah. going on in this building, including on tool CAD. Yeah, which origin. is which you can have a lot of fun with, but we try to keep it simple in the basics. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see in that little nameplate, you can still you can still get pretty creative yeah. with it. Moving on to some more complex shapes, we've got the project that we're going to cut a part of today, this passive phone amplifier. Um, everyone knows with a cell phone, you need to bump up that speaker <laughs> occasionally. And the next slide just shows a snippet of the detail in the project instructions here. Uh, you can see the project instructions in the in the PDF classroom guide. If you're already an origin owner and you want to go ahead and cut some of the projects that we're showing today also, we've got the cut files available to anyone on Shaper Hub. That, that third one is going to be our, our advanced project. It is a keepsake box. So we're starting to involve joinery. We're starting to involve workstation, which is the fixturing station for origin and we're really starting to dial in that fitment and using hardwoods or using really any material that you choose mm -hmm. um, but it was designed for hardwoods and again there's still some on tool cad challenges that your students will be presented with and all kinds of stuff yeah so we've seen this kind of across all age ranges too for everywhere from from middle school uh teachers are really finding it applicable in their classrooms to CTE colleges. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with Burlingame High School here in the Bay Area yep. with their uh, first robotics team also, <laughs> making <laughs> really all cool kinds of crazy plastic parts for their basketball shooting robot yeah. uh, made with Origin, which I love to see. That's probably one of the higher level uses that we've got out there. Yeah. Uh, what do you say we s dive into cutting? Yeah, let's just show the people point. how it works. Yeah. Uh, quick overview. This is Shaper Origin, handheld CNC machine. I am going to be just sitting here right with it. I'm looking out of that tape, and I my goal is to stay relatively close to my line, and Origin's going to do the rest of the magic for me. I have gone ahead. If you can show that overhead cam for me, Goose. I have gone ahead and cut the majority of this project. The nice thing about this project is it is just kind of laid out for you this is one file with all your parts in it and i am going to cut two more parts and walk you through the process so to start off we this whole thing is kind of a stacked plywood construction uh, and driven down the middle is dowels to bring it all together quarter inch dowels quarter inch ply so the first thing i want to do is make sure that those dowel holes fit nicely and i'm going to show off a couple of features on Origin that allow you to dial in that fitment. So I got my first hole here. First I'll just show off my workspace. And I'm zooming into it. This project has a lot of zooming in and zooming out, which is nice to have that pinch zoom. So I have my helix mode on, which means it's going to cut down helically to my final dimension. And I have my offset set to zero, so it's going to cut it to a true 0.25. So I'm just going to do this real quick. And as Jake's cutting, I'm going to step away possibly and narrate occasionally here so we don't get too much noise in the mic. All right, so I just cut that single hole right here, and I want to test fit my dowel 
Now, I'm going to be driving this through a couple of layers of plywood, so I don't want a super tight fit. I'm going to let glue do a little bit of the work for me, too, there. So that's at zero. I could probably get it in with a hammer, but I'm going to open it up, let's say, three thousandths of an inch. 0 0.003. Super tiny amount. Again, that's just making that hole that much bigger. And that's what we want to see. It's going to make our lives a lot easier when we're driving those through all the layers of plywood. Now that I know what my offset is going to be, I can move forward through all my holes, uh, bust those out really quick, and I can start doing the perimeter of the amplifier. So I'm going to dive in and do these holes, and then I'll switch over and I'll start cutting the perimeter. Now, going back to that poll question we have of what digital fabrication tech you teach in your curriculum, uh, you might think sheet goods, yeah, well, I could cut that with a laser cutter just as easily, and you're absolutely right. Yes, you could, um, but the difference between a laser cutter and Origin, as we see now, is that Jake is hands-on with the tool the whole time, and he's able to adjust on the fly. So as he went through that first hole, he was able to precisely adjust the offset to make sure that the dowel fit exactly the way that he wanted it to. And when we teach people how to use Origin, that's a eyes light up moment. And I love to see that. Um, but that's not to say that these skills aren't translatable. So any skill that you teach with Origin, especially with these flat sheet goods, is translatable also to a laser cutter or a larger gantry CNC router, uh, which is to say that these are skills that kids can take with them for the rest of their engineering or STEM education path. You can see now that Jake has switched from cutting the hole to cutting the contour, which really highlights one of the, uh, really the differentiator of Shaper Origin, which is that it auto-corrects for your hands as you move this handheld CNC router around. So anything that needs to be cut, uh, you need to have hands on the machine the whole time. And you can see that this project has something like 10 to 15 parts. And so that's an opportunity for 10 to 15 kids to have their hands on making just one passive amplifier here taking turns. Love to hear from everybody, not just in the poll question, but in the comments also, what digital fabrication tech you teach in your school or in your curriculum. If you've got any questions related to digital fabrication tech that you'd like us to talk about on the show uh, at the Q&A at the end, definitely love to hear that. So please get those questions in the comments. Now, Jake, you're busy cutting, but I noticed you might have bumped the table there a little bit, which we can revisit after you finish cutting out this part. But another key uh, facet of Origin is that it's really quite safe to use, um, and it's in a lot of ways error-proof. So if Jake were to bump the table so hard as to move Origin outside of its corrective range, the spindle would automatically retract. Um, as it's doing at the end of the cut, it would just interrupt itself in the middle of the cut if you move it too far off path. And so it's really easy to help your kids be successful um, as opposed to, you know, a jigsaw or a hand router or some of the other more traditional woodworking tools that are out there. It's both intuitive with the touchscreen technology. We've seen kids look at this touchscreen and say, oh, that looks an awful lot like my phone, have them pick it up a lot faster than some of our older customers that we work with. Um, but then at the same time, you can do these crazy complicated things with it and really get away with quite a lot, If even if you don't know much and you're, you're pushing your capabilities and the capabilities of the tool.
How are we doing, Jake? All right. Pop back on the set here. Everything's cut out. And I got a little bit of fuzz that I want to get off. But while everything's stuck down, I'm going to go ahead and take the opportunity to do a quick sand over the top of it just to get rid of some of that fuzz. Did you get that table bump that I mentioned? I was did get a little, a little table bump. Little bump. I saw yeah, your face or actually, go. Uh, my, stu my stool is on wheels, so I scooted away from it. <laughs> oh no! Oh, we need to put some brakes on these uh, on these stools. The uh, we should include this putty knife with Origin in the box oh, going just, forward. It makes taking shaper tape off an absolute breeze. It's one of those real essentials. And prying things up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to the overhead cam. Quick mention, too, on how I cut these out. We're working with quarter-inch ply, and I actually have quite a bit of double-sided tape underneath all these parts because I don't want them to break free, especially these little parts over here. Now, if you're trying to avoid using that much double-sided tape, you could do something called using tabs, which is essentially leaving little bits of connection, little bits of wood connecting to the overall form that you then come back in and cut with a chisel so it keeps things secure without having to use as much double-sided tape or any at all. Little pro tip. Little pro tip. We've got a lot of pro tips. We've got a whole session on pro tips. And so if this is your first session, please go back and watch all of our other sessions. We have them hosted on demand on shapertools.com slash sessions. All right. Oh, and you got the big boy out um, for this yeah. one. Pardon me while I do All this. right. Nothing like a little quick sand. Should probably step away from this one also. A little bit on the loud side. The comment about the tabs um, jumps out at me as one of those ways that you can teach kids to think intuitively about the physical world, um, how things hold together and how things go together. Double-sided tape is such a simple fastener, um, but really a lot of our world right now is held together with it. All of our phone screens are attached with essentially double-sided tape. Um, and if you've got a kid that wants to work at Apple someday, in your classroom, then just getting a sense for how these things work and how to fasten parts together, uh, anywhere from double-sided tape to more complex machining structures like tabs or like an onion skin at the bottom, all those are really important and helpful. This is why I brought out the big pry. Yeah. Yeah, I got so much double-sided tape on there, I really didn't want anything to pop off on me. Yeah, not on uh, live TV. I'm just going to watch while you do this. <laughs> just watch me struggle. Yeah, exactly. You got that pry bar? Yeah. Sometimes it is a lot easier to remove the uh, remove the waste first. At oh, yeah, and then I can actually it. get under the pieces. Mm -hmm. There we go. There Pretty we good. Go. Spoil board, as always, coming in clutch here. If you give me these pieces in the order they're to be assembled, Ooh. <laughs> that would help me out. I know that's not how we do things here. Assembly can be a little bit competitive sometimes. Oh, it's always so fun when one, one of us cuts something and, and just hands it off to the other and says, all right, you got to assemble it now. Mm -hmm. Fun is uh, one way to put it since I am in the assembler's seat today. Let's see, we got these, these all stacked together. Um, I will say as we are just prying these pieces off of our spoil board, please ask your questions in the comments for us or for Mel, anything about uh, digital fabrication, education, uh, STEM, CTE, all that stuff. And also answer our poll question to be entered in our giveaways. We're giving away a swag pack, which is a hat, a shop banner, and a pack of stickers. We're also giving away a Shaper t-shirt. And then last but not least, for a classroom near you, we are giving away a Origin and Workstation to a lucky educator or school administrator. If you work for a school in some STEAM or STEM adjacent capacity, um, we're thinking of you. So answer all those questions and we'll find your school and pick one random winner to get that Origin and Workstation. Let's see, I've lost complete track of which parts are right. rich. 
It's a good thing we have the uh, the origin classroom guide here with our step by step instructions to help us figure out which ones are which. What I like about this project, a couple things. We're doing it out of quarter inch ply. That's what it recommends, but you could really do it out of whatever kind of material that you want it to. You could do it out of neon green acrylic. You could. That would be really I cool. I think that would be cool. And you could get a little Arduino and you could put some LEDs in there. And you could get a microphone and you could program the Arduino to listen to the microphone and pulse the LEDs with the beat of the tunes. I mean, now I just got to challenge you to build this because so, I want to see it. <laughs> you know how many projects are on my list already, Jake. The other cool thing is this is a rectangle that is generally sized for most phones. But if you have something, if you have a chunky phone case on there, you can use offsets directly on Origin to make that, that area for your phone larger mm -hmm. or for or, your student's phone. Or if you're a super pro or are teaching your kids uh, 2D or 3D design software like Fusion 360 or Illustrator, you could have them go in and modify the 2D file, which is like the next level. Absolutely. I've got a question for Mel. Mel, are you still there? I am here. Okay, perfect. Sorry, we haven't been... Uh, we've been busy over here. Haven't been as inclusive as I would have liked. But I am curious what software you use at your school. For design? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have most of our students work with Tinkercad because they use that uh, for some other projects as well as for the... Uh, the project with the shaper. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we go directly from Tinkercad to an SVG file that uh, we use in the origin. Usually um, we like to check it first and I use Illustrator for that and uh, you know if we have to clean it up or sort of change the layout of pieces we can do that really quickly in Illustrator. Cool. Jake's a big Illustrator guy. It's the only thing I use. I haven't gotten to Tinkercad yet. Have you used Tinkercad Jake? I haven't. All right. Tinkercad, the, the advantage we find it with Tinkercad is that it's super easy for kids to learn to do it. Um, we usually start with our sixth graders. They're designing crumple zone buffers or bumpers, and, um, and they, they generally learn to use. There's some tutorials in Tinkercad. They go through those tutorials, and in 10 or 15 minutes, they're ready to design. So that's a little different than Illustrator. There's a lot, lot more moving parts with Illustrator that have to be yeah. mastered first. Often Absolutely. these bigger programs have a lot of hidden things to where the, the more user-friendly or, or learner programs are, you know, all the menus and things are a little easier to find and navigate. Mm -hmm. So things like Tinkercad, mm -hmm. Inkscape, et cetera. Yeah. Goose, can we go to this bench cam and I'll show the assembly? I don't want to get too far because it's honestly going a little quicker than I thought. Good. I was still worried that you're going to yeah. have to bust out the mallet. I know, right? It's a, it's a perfect slip fit, Jake. It's a good opportunity also to learn about tolerances. What is a press fit? What is a slip fit? What is an interference fit for dowels or fasteners? These ones I might have to put on one at a time. There we go. Yeah, this might be the first time that we don't have to use the mallet live. Oh, but I like using the mallet live. I might just bust it out for fun. Just one, one final hit. Obviously, if you were putting this together at your school, you might want to use glue to hold it together for final assembly. That's a whole different topic we're not even going to breach today. Getting a little ambitious doing three at a time here. <laughs> okay, got to do it. There we go. Beautiful. And you would just trim these with a flush trim saw. That's all in the instructions. Uh, and you have a beautiful passive speaker amplifier right there. Awesome. I feel like that's enough of our nonsense. We should get Mel on. Well, that's talk true. To Mel. Um, one more reminder, as always, please answer the poll question that's going to pop up below. What digital fabrication technologies do you teach in your curriculum or in your classroom? and enter to win that origin workstation. Uh, Mel, thank you for your patience. <laughs> so glad to have you here.
if you're going to teach middle school, you've got to be patient. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, is that that's primarily what you teach middle school these days? Absolutely. Yeah, it's six, six, seventh, and eighth grades. Okay. Uh, I'm really curious about that. What is it like starting uh, STEM education that young? I remember when I was in school, I started in high school. These kids are ready for it. Um, one of the reasons we, we are really pushing, one of the reasons I decided to uh, focus on middle school is that this is where we lose a lot of kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Between the fourth and the seventh grade, um, interests change. Some of it's due to just sort of normal development and puberty and so forth. But uh, we find, especially girls, a lot of these kids come in hugely enthusiastic at the beginning of school. And in a year, year and a half, uh, we've lost the majority of them. And there's some, there's some reasons for that. Microsoft has done some pretty interesting research on some of the reasons. But um, we find that that the, the middle school kids are really capable of a whole lot more than they're really given credit for. Mm -hmm. And so when I first saw uh, Origin being demonstrated at a conference, I thought, boy, I know that a lot of our kids, even in sixth grade, will be fine with using this. And they will be so excited because it's, uh, as you pointed out earlier, truly hands on and it's hands on throughout the, the fabrication process. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been really rewarding. I, we have a pre-engineering teacher that I collaborate with very closely, and we decided last year that we were going to really focus on trying to get more girls to be interested and stay interested or just to discover that they're interested. And I uh, had a great note from a girl, our great, great graduated last week, and she said, thank you for helping me realize my love of engineering. And I thought, boy, that, that kind of makes the year right there. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah, I love that. Um, with those kids, could you paint a picture for us of your classroom, um, what it looks like, where it is in the school, how you interact with other, uh, other teachers and classes, uh, what tools you use, things like that? Sure. It's, uh, it, it's, it's variable, to, to be honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. We have about 1,400 students in, in the school, and our pre-engineering program basically has six classes, 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade and about 25 students in each one. So we don't formally touch anything like the majority of students. Now, over the course of uh, three years, we probably probably see them uh, at least, I'd say, a third of them formally. There are some students that come in, they take other electives. Some of those electives they have to be involved for an entire year. So um, they're, they're kind of cut out of some of the other options. but. Uh, but we have a fairly robust uh, sub-student body. And in addition to the pre-engineering program, we work with, with all of the other teachers in all subjects. And our, our concept has been whole school STEM. And we, we feel that uh, we can apply engineering design, uh, STEM activities, the STEM experiences in any, school, any class, whether it's English or math or social studies. And in fact, some of our early adopters and most enthusiastic teachers were e ELA and social studies teachers. Mm -hmm. um, like, so, like many things, when you start out, most of what you thought you know turns out to be wrong. So uh, it's, it's been an adventure. One of the things that we hear a lot, uh, or one, one of the things that I hear has changed since I was in school, is the move from STEM to STEAM. And so you say that your STEM program is a whole school STEM program. Um, obviously, whole school means that it includes the arts somehow. How do you work with arts educators in your as you're a STEM coach? One of our first adopters was was our arts teacher. Um, and this is this is back eleven years ago, and she she had many many ideas. And uh, one of the things she's done, for example, is to have her students make a uh, kinetic sculpture. And they're challenged to find s scrap materials, things that they can salvage, and make a sculpture that moves, lights up, and makes a noise. So the, the kids come up with an amazing variety of things. And a lot of the time, they need to fabricate components or um, integrate electronics or some of these things that uh, 
and, and the STEM comes naturally to it. Uh, we, we did sort of think about STEAM when we were talking about STEM and, you know, it's, it's kind of cute, you know, it's a changes the name a little bit. Um, but we were really trying to push this idea of all classes. So we were trying to come up with acronyms that included everybody. And the only ones people came up with were kind of obscene. So we sort of abandoned that project and said, we'll just, we'll just stick to whole school STEM. And um, if people ask about STEAM, we'll say, yep, it's in there. So mm -hmm. that's where we come to it. Thanks. Yeah, I feel like I've been asking all the questions. That's and okay. And I see you. I see you ready to go. That is okay. Jake's got one fired up for you. Um, I'm just curious where you see STEM going into the future. What's next? Well, I think that I mean, what we've seen since we started. I mean, 11 years ago, STEM programs in schools were kind of rare. Uh, since then, over the last 10 years, it's it's become much more mainstream. There's been a lot more research done on, on what's effective at uh, increasing interest, student interest in STEM, and it's, 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 it's continuing to grow. And I think it's going to, going to continue to grow because this is where the jobs are. Um, we, we know state after state after state, um, they can't get this, the, the tech, 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 technical talent that they need uh, to attract investors like Bosch or Boeing and these are ones that we have in the Charleston area, and they have had problems getting uh, getting the, the skills that they need. And so they are very interested in these programs and uh, are, are big supporters of what we're trying to do. So I, th I think it's only going to continue because I don't th see us getting less dependent on technology as a whole in terms of our overall economy. So the, the more, I mean, microcontrollers are everywhere, for example, so that um, the, the need to have people who at least have a rudimentary understanding um, mm -hmm. is, is only going to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've had students that, that, you know, will say that they're not interested in science or math. They may be interested in health sciences, but once they start working with some of these tools, they say, oh, I can see how this could be relevant to what I plan to do in, in health. So I, th I think that's, that's our concept that uh, regardless of what you think your career is going to be, whether it's music, art, teaching math it's you'll always have a way to use some of these tools and it'll make the whole education process much more interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i see that being a challenge in the nation uh, a lack of stem educated students um what what are some of the challenges that you face in the classroom as a stem educator the biggest challenge is that it's different for teachers um that I, I hate to say it, but we still have a reasonable number of teachers who really like worksheets and PowerPoints. And um, it keeps the kids busy. It's easy to grade. Uh, some teachers are proud that they've done the same thing for the last five years. Um, <laughs> I think mm -hmm. it's kind of a disaster myself, but uh, but that's that's the problem because it uh, it is it's different. And one of our one of our early adopters, an ELA teacher, said it's not harder; it's just different. And getting people to, to overcome that initial fear of the unknown is is a challenge every every year, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's just something we continue to struggle with. Mm -hmm. Speaking of worksheets and powerpoints, uh, you sent us some photos of the work that some of your students have done, and so I think it would be a good opportunity to pull up our slide deck and show some of those off to just show how far from worksheets and. Uh, just how far from worksheets we are right now. This is a kid working hands-on with Origin. Um, but if we jump to the next slide, these are some of the photos, Mel, that you sent us. Could you describe some of these for us? Sure. The, the two on the right, the two on the right is a, is a seventh grade project we do with all the seventh graders. They work in pairs, design these uh, uh, birdhouses of their own design in Tinkercad. Um, they, they have to do some research and identify what kind of bird they think they're going to attract and then go from there. And we, you know, after doing this once, we put some constraints on in terms of the number of pieces and the size of the, of the of raw stock that they'll be working with. Um, and, and you can see they come up with a real variety of, of designs, which is fine. That's, that's exactly what we want them to do. Um, the, the girl on the left is actually a second semester eighth grade student who's part of our independent study program and she was uh designing something that required 
um, pieces that were bigger than we could actually accommodate in uh, in either our shot bot or laser cutter, but the origin was perfect and she'd had some experience with that in the birdhouse project. So she was quite comfortable um, picking that up and producing the pieces that she needed for that. Awesome. So cool. Let's go to the next slide, Goose. We've got one more. Can you narrate this for us, Mel? Sure. Okay, so on the left and right, we have uh, a group of sixth grade girls that are cutting a frog chair. Um, and we don't have the time tonight to describe what a frog chair is, but, uh, <laughs> but they were doing it. And uh, this is before we had the uh, the Festool dust collector. So they had a, a little shop vac hooked up and needed to have somebody tending the the vacuum hose as uh, the other student was doing the cutting. The girl in the middle uh, wanted to make a watch box uh, for her father for Christmas. And this is right after we'd received the uh, the workstation. And I have to tell you that the process of cutting those box joints was uh, just wonderful because the workstation is so, so easy to use for that and so precise. Uh, she also wanted to have lights inside, so we added it LED strip that you can see there on the uh, right side of the box or the front of the box. Mm -hmm. And she was pretty proud of herself and uh, excited to be able to con construct something like that. That's very, very cool. Um, as we hop back to the conversation, I just want to remind everyone who may have missed the first part of the show that we're here talking about origin in the classroom. And we've got Mel Goodwin, PhD, I might add, here with us from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. He's a STEM coach at the middle school there. Uh, and we've done a little origin demo. If you missed that, you could go back and watch it any other time. Uh, right now we're in the meat of the good stuff. We're yeah. doing a little Q and A with Mel. Um, please, if anyone is watching you, I'm sure you have questions for Mel, drop those in the comments below. Uh, Ted is moderating, moderating our comments as usual. And any questions that you have for Mel, he'll pass along to us and we'll pass those on to Mel during the Q&A at the end of the show. Cool. I have a question, Mel. And Goose, could you bring Mel back up? If possible. Um, I love that picture in picture. Yeah, and the picture in picture. I like it. Um, so in, there we go. I know in my middle school, I had an awesome wood shop, but I feel like that is not as true in, um, in most schools, or they're losing their wood shops, and they're maybe at a point now where they're looking to incorporate shop tools again back into their curriculum um and we've always thought the origin was great for that because it's kind of a little self-contained you don't need a whole shop it can be the start of a shop or it could be the shop kind of thing um but I, I think that's yeah i mean it, it, first of all you're right i mean they i had wood shop in middle school and they, nobody has wood shop in middle school anymore um which is real a real shame because uh when our kids, for example, when they're doing the birdhouse project, they have absolutely no prior knowledge of anything. Uh, they, they, they don't know a nail from a screw. They don't know how to prepare a, a joint to use either of those, actually. Um, they, are, they are just uh, completely inexperienced with anything like that. And regardless of how technical and um, advanced our society becomes, people still need to know how to use a hammer and screwdriver. And um, it's it's a problem for them. And it will be a problem for them if they don't know how to do that. And it really isolates them from a lot of exciting things that they could be doing if they just had some of those basic skills. So uh, I, I, I pray for the day when we get wood shop or something like it back into the middle school curriculum. Certainly in high school, um, if people are in certain technical sort of career technical education programs, they, they will be exposed to more tools. Um, but the, the origin is, is really a, uh, a unique beast because it is, allows so much precision and at the same time, so it's so accessible uh, to people who are just starting to use it. And as, as the classroom guide shows, you can start out very simple uh, with a project that takes, you know, an hour or two to do, and you can take it right up to something that's much more challenging and uh, 
that is, is pretty much open ended. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah we, we need to have more of this. And I think the origin is a real, a real benefit because it's, uh, it, it makes it so much more accessible both to the instructor and to the students. Mm -hmm. I like that. And, and we know that some schools are breaking into CNC's or laser cutters, and I don't think there's, there's nothing wrong with that. The difference here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that hands-on aspect. CNC's are awesome, but you get, you, you spend the time creating the file, you send it off to the CNC, and then you have the whole class watching it do the job um, versus getting all the kids to have their hands on the tool and feeling that pride exactly. at the end of it. And, and there's, as you pointed out earlier too, it's sometimes it's nice to be able to stop, you know, if you think something's going wrong or yeah. uh, you've got, you've got a question about the process. It's a lot of times it's too late when you're using a CNC to, to react. Um, but with the origin, you can. And uh, as you said, you know, if it goes off the, uh, the prescribed path, the worst that can happen it usually is that uh, the spindle will retract and uh, the cutting stops. Mm -hmm. Perfect time to raise your hand and ask, uh, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, what's going on here? Yeah. I have a question about that. The teaching, teaching middle schoolers, uh, seems appropriately young. Like that's, that's gotta be the time to get folks started, but people worry, I'm sure about safety. So what do you do for safety in your shop? Um, with, with a horde of 25 middle schoolers running around? Well, the students that, that use our fabrication laboratory or that are in the pre-engineering program pretty much get the riot act read to them at the beginning in terms of what happens if, uh, if they don't behave appropriately. And with 1,400 kids, you're going to have some that uh, probably are, are not going to be able to manage themselves um, as, as we want them to. And, and they um, get a series of warnings and... Um, will eventually be removed for some period of time until they get their act together. However, that said, we have very few behavior problems. Uh, we used to do a, a project in, that involved greenhouse building, and we had sixth graders using uh, electric drills, hand drills. And the first time we did it, our assistant principal was just freaking out because he was sure somebody was going to get drilled. And <laughs> out of the 600 kids that did the project, we did we had no behavior problems and even the kids who were chronic behavior problems were completely on task and uh and the assistant principal said for this is the first time they've been doing what they're supposed to do all year um and he, he was he was blown away frankly that uh, the kids do respond um to that kind of expectation because as is the case with a lot of our stem things they really want to do it because it's not a worksheet it's not watching a powerpoint uh, they're they're being given the opportunity to create their own ideas, and that to every student, regardless of their academic achievement level, um, finds that opportunity really exciting, and they they identify that as probably the most exciting thing, just to be able to do what's in their head to see it take take physical form. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can identify with that definitely. Jake, what did I walk into you doing yesterday morning, end of the month? put off oh yeah my your expense reports <laughs> my expenses <laughs> we'd rather just be messing around in the shop than doing our expense reports don't yeah. tell accounting <sighs> clerical but things? it's yeah yeah it's all about those the paperwork of the forms rather be building the table mel what what are some tips or strategies that you can maybe share with uh some of the teachers and educators watching today on how to incorporate origin into their classroom one of the things that we've done that's been really successful um, is to put that question to the students. Um, I love that. We do an activity. <laughs> perfect. I mean, you know, they're, they're the creative ones. So, you know, why, sh why should we strain too much? Um, but one of the things we, we do with, uh, with really all of our students is to do an exercise called wireframing, which is essentially creating Jeopardy style games with a pre presentation software like uh, PowerPoint or Keynote. And the students have to, I mean, sometimes we give them the option to, uh, to select a subject. Sometimes they can, we, we assign a subject and say, okay, so you're studying 
forces in motion in science, we want you to create a question deck uh, with, you know, one or two dozen questions. And then our teacher talks to them about depth of knowledge levels, DOK, so they can identify what's a good question and what's a pretty basic question. Um, and again, they almost all of them respond to that because, again, they're giving a lot more agency in the learning process. And what you end up with after doing that exercise is a whole bunch of great review questions that uh, look like games to the kids, but the the dirty little secret is they have to master the content before they can even create the deck. Mm -hmm. So then once they've done that, we can say, so we've got these 3D printers or we've got uh, an origin. What do you, what could we create that would help master this content? And, uh, and the kids come up with some great ideas. I mean, sometimes it's maps, sometimes it's uh, devices that hold artifacts and other objects. Um, you know, if you've got 25 kids, you're going to have probably at least a dozen really good ideas. And, um, and, and that's where we make the connections. Now, there's some things that are obvious, you know, in social studies, creating maps. Um, that's, that's pretty obvious. That's a pretty easy thing to do also. Um, and it's a great little introduction that, uh, you know, kids come in, they just love to spend 15 minutes and cut out the shape of South Carolina. Um, <laughs> yeah. It gives them a little takeaway it, too. It doesn't get old until you, it doesn't get old until you've done it once. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. What else you got, Jake? If any more questions, Mel? Are there any questions that we should have asked you but we haven't yet? Before like we get that. into the Q and A. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think that the, the the big obstacle for for the students and other teachers is that unknown that not having done it. It's, it's a power tool, it cuts stuff, it's, uh, you know, it kind of makes noise, it's kind of scary, um, but once they've done it and it takes 30 seconds or less, they're, they're into it and they, they understand it. And I think just getting people to take, take that plunge, which isn't a real big plunge, mm -hmm. but uh, you, know, you can point out to them that you, know, you gotta really work at it if you're gonna get hurt. I mean, you gotta pick the thing up, it's heavy, you're going to have to put your hand underneath it. Um, it's going to be hard to do. Mm -hmm. And and they'll, they'll sort of laugh about that, about, you know, the idea of going through all these gyrations to, to get hurt. But it's, uh, it makes the point. And the teachers are the same way. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you have to have to understand what their their fears are and then just sort of say, OK, let's let's just try it. It's going to be really controlled. I'm standing right here. Uh, if you want to turn it off, this is what you do. So they've got all the control that they, and that's again the great advantage that it's not a CNC robot that's sort of charging around its own on its own. That you you know, it's cool. It, it does a lot of stuff, but you're still in control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And too, I just want to put out there, put this out there to everyone. We are here for you if you are an educator exactly. that is looking to get into this, but you don't really know how you. Are, are afraid of maybe not knowing how to use a tool and needing an extra hand, that is our job. Our job is to get you up to speed, mm -hmm. whether it's through sessions, through our customer service, we are here to help you get up and running with the tool so that you can share it with your students. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. It's been fun. Thank you, Mel.